the events and proclamations of 1933 and their effect on gold ownership, which had culminated only days earlier on January 30th, intrigued him and awakened his curiosity. On February 2nd, 1934, Garrett wrote to White Raymond, America's foremost coin dealer. It might be interesting for me to add to my collection, if it is not against the law, the last gold pieces, $20, $10, $5, and $250. I do not know whether any or all of these were struck last year, but perhaps if you can come across the actual last ones in proof or uncirculated condition, you might put them aside for me. Raymond, whose contacts were legion, checked around, certainly with his well-connected, sometimes partner in Philadelphia, James G. McAllister, all in vain. He finally replied to Garrett on March 29, 1934. He said, quote, In reference to your inquiry about gold coins, would say that 10s and 20s were struck in 1933, but have never been able to get them. End of quote. No one could, yet. So what I'm reading here is an excerpt from the great book by David Tripp titled Illegal Tender. The book tells the entire story of the 1933 double eagle gold coin and how it was created and how it became the most valuable coin in the world. I just read a letter from the legendary coin collector, John Garrett. It was a letter that he sent to his coin dealer, White Raymond, in early 1934, asking if he could locate the gold coin struck in 1933 of each denomination so he could add them to his collection. But Garrett didn't even know if the coins existed. The wise and prudent coin collector John Garrett had just realized the unprecedented economic and political events of 1933 totally altered the landscape of coin collecting. The rules of gold ownership were completely rewritten and also ended for the foreseeable future the creation of all gold coins by the U.S. government. Then the population of existing coins around the country would be totally obliterated. So John Garrett realized there might be extreme rarity and historical significance to these 1933 gold coins just produced in the previous year by the U.S. Mint, if they even produced them. And now he wants his dealer to find out if he can find a few of them for his collection. The only problem is, as his dealer responds, his dealer says he can't get them. And he's one of the top coin dealers back in those days, White Raymond. Raymond first responds that he's pretty sure the $10 and $20 gold coins were created, but he's not able to locate any of them for his wealthy customer. And this is a great place to start the story of the 1933 St. Gaudens Double Eagle. I need to introduce you to this amazing book by David Tripp. Published in 2004, you wouldn't even believe what amazing detail David Tripp researched for this book. I would strongly recommend you check this out for yourself. The book is called Illegal Tender, and the subtitle is Gold, Greed, and the Mystery of the Lost 1933 Double Eagle. Now we have to back up just a little bit from John Garrett's request, which he sent on February 4th, 1934, we need to back up to the previous year to understand why Garrett was asking for these coins. Let's go back to the previous year. David Tripp sets up the birth of the 1933 double eagle in his book like this. He says, quote, on February 18th, work finally got underway on the 1933 $20 gold pieces, still the country's largest, grandest, and most beautiful conceived coins. It was the 25th year St. God's design was struck, and it was to be the last. So that was Tripp in his book. And so after 25 years of St. Godden's double eagle gold coins, Tripp just said this is going to be the last year, 1933, that these coins would be made. So when most people think about the early 1930s in America, they'll think about the Great Depression. At least that's what pops into my head. So 1933 was a pivotal year in U.S. history, and it just happens to be the date of the most valuable coin in the world, the 1933 Double Eagle, the same coin that sold a few years ago for almost $19 million. That's almost double the price of the second most valuable coin to ever sell at auction, which was the 1794 flowing hair silver dollar. The same coin I did an episode on not too long ago. It was the very first silver dollar created at the newly established U.S. Mint in Philadelphia. 
But why is the 1933 St. Gaudens double eagle worth $19 million? That's exactly what we're going to look at in this episode, how it was created and how it became so rare and valuable. And the book by David Tripp is the best book on the subject that I've found so far. If anyone knows of a better book on the 1933 St. Gaudens double eagle, please let me know. But I love this book by David Tripp called Illegal Tender. So let's keep going from the quote I just read. We're in February of 1933, and work begins at the Mint to get started creating these double eagle coins. David Tripp's book goes through the entire minting process. He explains how the U.S. Mint struck gold coins back in 1933. The research for this book must have taken years because it's so detailed. Tripp explains how the process to mint gold coins back in 1933 was in many ways similar to how it's been done for centuries. So the book goes through each step on the creation of the double eagle gold coins from start to finish, page after page, down to every last detail. Tripp's research even includes the layout of the mint building itself and the names of the rooms as the coins move their way through the minting process. It's pretty amazing this picture that David Tripp paints through this entire story by describing the tiniest little details. So now by March 2nd, 1933, the first batch of double eagles were ready to be struck. This happened to also be the Thursday before President-elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt was to be sworn in that Saturday. Something that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, but you have to remember this, at this exact time, there was a major banking crisis going on around the country and around the entire world. This was the darkest times of the Great Depression, and when the entire banking system was totally stressed to the limits, and banks were closing down day after day after day at this point in time. But work at the U.S. Mint continued, even with the upcoming inauguration at the Capitol in just a few days. So with 170 tons of pressure, the Mint presses struck down and created the very first St. Gaudens Double Eagle. On that first day, just about 4,000 double eagles were struck and moved down the hallway to the coiner's vault. Just a few days later, on March 6th, 1933, FDR is in. The new president is sworn into office. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is inheriting a major economic crisis. At this same time, workers at the U.S. Mint have just created the first bags full of 1933 St. Gaudens double eagle gold coins. So I love these points in history when we can trace back to an exact moment. It's the moment where the iconic collectible rare coin like this 1933 double eagle collides precisely with all these other major events that are happening all around it. You see this over and over with the most valuable rare coins. So it's really cool. This is it. The moment. So let's look at Tripp's book. Here's how he describes the very beginning of the first batch of 1933 double eagles starting to roll off the mint presses. He says, quote, the physical process of making money was precise. Every separate act was carefully scripted, each dependent on the other, yet independently executed. All along the way, differences were carefully noted in the coiner's records. By the end of business on Wednesday, March 8th, approximately 22,000 1933 double eagles had been made, not yet enough to pass on to the cashier. So there it is. Trip is telling you that there's a very strict process here that's followed year after year when these gold coins are made. And the procedure is incredibly important, not just for quality control, but mostly for security purposes. You have average everyday American citizens working these jobs at the Mint, and they're handling the production of gold coins all day long. So of course, there's got to be certain measures set up for security purposes, and there's tons of different checks and balances as these gold coins are minted and then moved throughout the building. And the record keeping was very precise and exact to be sure not even a single coin was snuck out the door by an employee of the Mint, as tempting as it probably was. So the book goes on to outline exactly how many gold double eagle coins were produced and then moved into the Mint vaults for storage. The previous year, 1932, they created about 445,000 pieces. That's roughly $9 million worth. 
Now, almost all of these coins from 1932 and even back from 1931, for that matter, almost all of them were still sitting in the mint vaults. Then in 1933, another $9 million worth of double eagle coins are set to be minted. That's 445,000 coins. So just like previous years, that's what happened. March of 1933, while the newly elected President Roosevelt is sworn into the Oval Office, the Mint continues to create the double eagle gold coins. And now David Tripp in his book, he describes it like this. He says, as the political firestorm in Washington raged and gold lost its place as a medium of exchange, the mint in Philadelphia, seemingly oblivious to the real world, lethargically cranked out its golden product. And that's great writing right there by Trip. but we have to stop right here. What's this all about? I just read a quote from the book where Trip writes, he said, the political firestorm in Washington raged. What is he talking about? This is a key part to the 1933 Double Eagle story. So we have to understand this firestorm that he mentions right here. We already know President Franklin Roosevelt is about to be sworn into office. He just won the election in a landslide victory over Herbert Hoover, who was struggling through the economic depression during nearly all four years of his presidential term. And now for several months between FDR's election victory and being sworn into office in March, the economy is getting worse by the day and banks are failing and everything's starting to crumble. Roosevelt is getting ready to inherit the tanking economy and just before the inauguration, the banking crisis is raging to a point where the leaders in Washington need to come up with a plan to save the entire system while Roosevelt is still the president-elect during this transition period before he's even in office. And every single twist and turn during this transition period for Roosevelt is completely laid out in David Tripp's book. It's incredible because it's such an important part of the 1933 Double Eagle story. Tripp goes through all the events from the election in 1932, then Roosevelt assembling his team of advisors and trying to deal with this economic crisis as the president-elect and all the way up to his inauguration and everything after that to try to instill the confidence back into the financial system. It's all in Tripp's book, step by step. So it's an amazing account. And it's, it's a few chapters in this book with tons of detail. So it could easily be another entire episode here just looking at this transition period because there's just so much going on. There's so much happening around the country and around the entire world at this time. But here's how Tripp describes the dire situation that FDR is about to inherit from President Hoover. This is how he describes it in his book. He says, in early 1930, unemployment reached 4 million. By the end of 1932, the number had more than tripled to approximately 25% of the workforce. Only a quarter of these people received any relief funds, however pitiful, from local government or private agencies. And now Tripp goes on. He says, Abroad, the world economy was similarly shattered. Much of Europe's malaise could be directly attributed to the fiscal consequences of World War I and the crushing terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Herbert Hoover called that war the primary cause of the Great Depression. Germany buckled under the cost of reparations, which it owed primarily to Britain and France. In a precarious international cycle of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, American financiers lent Germany much of the money it needed to make its payments. These millions then found their way back to the United States government as repayment by France and Britain of the loans they had been issued during the war. So this is all trip. He's, he, and he adds this. He says, when the crash of 1929 deprived the American bankers of that essential ingredient, liquidity, the Europeans as a result lacked the funds needed to service their debts, and the financial house of cards collapsed. So that was David Tripp from his book. It's a summary of what sparked the Great Depression, but over the course of several years now, all of these events led to a tightening of lending and liquidity around the world is what he's 
basically is what he's trying to say. So even by the late 1920s, you think about the 1920s as the roaring 20s, but even in the late 1920s, banks were already struggling. And by 1930, over 1,300 banks failed in a single year. So this crisis fed on itself in a sort of a doom loop because the global economy was connected like it had never been before. Even though today this would look like a crisis, like an, almost in slow motion because things just move so much faster in the global economy today. But this erosion of confidence in the financial institutions around the entire world took several years to play out back then. But the momentum of the crisis started to build and that's where we're at in this story now. Right between the U.S. election in 1932, at the end of 1932 in November, and, and then in, when FDR was taking office in early 1933. Now from Tripp's book, here's where the rubber meets the road. At least back in those days. It's a key phrase that I need to read. Here's how David Tripp says it in his book. He says, There seemed to be only one raft left to cling to in the roiling sea of economic uncertainty gold. So why does Tripp bring up gold? Back in 1933, most countries around the world were still using gold to back their monetary system. What was commonly known as the gold standard? I know you've heard that term, that phrase all over the place, but this is how banks and the entire countries guaranteed the value of their currency back then. And like Tripp says, in one form or another. So it wasn't a completely clear cut and uniform gold standard system around the world, but it was the same principle. Most banking was backed by actual gold, physical gold. And here's how Tripp says it again from his book. He says, from country to country, the amount of money in circulation was a fixed ratio to the amount of gold held in their reserves. When gold flowed out of a nation's coffers in the course of trade, the monetary base shrank, credit was tightened, and deflationary forces were brought into play. The United States began hemorrhaging gold. Savvy investors, such as Charles Merrill, one of the founders of Merrill Lynch, had predicted the Great Crash in February 1929 and had liquidated his positions. Now wary of the precarious state of the banks, he saw gold as a safe harbor and, and privately advised those of his inner circle to buy gold coins and send them out of the country. That was from the book. Now we can start to see how important gold was back in the day. If you're not already aware of this, wealthy people started hoarding gold coins and trying to store them out of the country because the Federal Reserve had actually started keeping records of anyone withdrawing gold in large amounts. And David Tripp talks about this in his book too. He says he calls them sophisticated hoarders. So basically rich people and businesses started to set up shell companies in other countries to hide their gold, hoping that the U.S. government wouldn't be able to track them to someday possibly confiscate their stash. So you have countries and governments, wealthy people and companies, they're all looking for gold to protect themselves from the distrust of these banks that were failing with every week that went by. And of course, this leaves the average citizen who, who they might not have a huge fortune, but they began to catch on to what was happening and they started to do the exact same thing. They began to pull gold coins from their banks and it might not be large quantities just for one average person. But when everybody starts to do the same thing, it really starts to add up fast. And suddenly gold is rapidly disappearing from the banking system all at once. And who knows where it's going? Maybe it's going into private safes or vaults in foreign countries, under mattresses, maybe buried in the backyard underground. Who knows? But the one place it's not, it's not in the banks anymore. And that's how the entire system was set up to have the majority of the gold stored at banks and with the government. So you can see the huge problem they have now. And I'll just read this passage from Tripp's book because he says it very, very well here. He's, here's where we're at in early 1933. He says, the constant trickle of the little guy's withdrawals combined with the riptide of the yellow metal to companies and even countries hoping to right their own beleaguered economies created such a tidal wave of uncertainty, instability, and fear 
that the nation's banking system edged yet closer to the brink of total collapse. And now we have another big problem here. The president of the United States since 1928 was Herbert Hoover. He's just been voted out and FDR just won a huge landslide victory in the election. But like Tripp just said, the banking system is getting closer to, quote, the brink of total collapse. Now we have to make it a few more long months until Roosevelt takes office in March and then somebody can take control of this uh, situation that's just getting out of hand. They called it the Great Void. The four months between the election and FDR getting sworn in. But things got so bad that individual states were declaring their own banking holidays is what they called them during this Great Void. And nobody really knew what to do. And apparently President Hoover just didn't have the confidence of the people anymore after just grinding through four really, really tough years. And he knew there was nothing he could do to reestablish any kind of stability at that point. So everybody knew he was just a lame duck. There was just nothing. The the only thing they could hope for was just to get to this inauguration. And then amazingly, even newly elected Franklin Roosevelt didn't have many ideas initially. Roosevelt didn't even pick his secretary of the treasury until two weeks before the inauguration. (laughs) And maybe he tried sooner and nobody was crazy enough to accept the job is one idea I had. But this entire thing just sort of lingered for a few months until finally Roosevelt asked William Wooden to be his secretary of the treasury. And this is from Tripp's book. This is what he says. Roosevelt made the offer stunned. The slightly built, self-effacing, 64-year-old Wooden asked to sleep on it. 24 hours later, he accepted what Raymond Moley considered, quote, to be one of the most heroic jobs in the administration. And I'm sure he had, he didn't sleep much that night because this is a huge job that he's taking on right now. Uh, and so Tripp, Tripp keeps going in his book to describe this grim scene that Roosevelt and Wooden are now going to face together. Tripp says, Will Wooden's acceptance came with the inauguration just two weeks off. Since election day, the financial crisis had gathered speed and careened out of control. Although there had been runs on banks through January, during the first two weeks of February, withdrawals of gold and currency had accelerated to 15 million per day, triple what they had been previously. It was unsettling when Louisiana declared a bank holiday at the beginning of the month. But when two weeks later, on February 14th, 1933, Governor Comstock of heavily industrialized Michigan slapped an eight-day moratorium on the state's banks. A shiver rippled through the country and erupted in panic. So there's this buildup going on right now to the panic, and it's almost leading right up to Inauguration Day. And because there's no real leadership in place yet, but William Wooden gets busy, and he begins meeting with the current Treasury Secretary, Ogden Mills even before he's confirmed into the new job. And together they work pretty much around the clock monitoring the banking situation and trying to come up with a few solutions. In the meantime, over $300 million worth of gold was withdrawn from banks in the month leading up to the inauguration. And to give you an idea of the acceleration of this panic, $226 million of that was withdrawn in the final week before FDR was sworn in. So you can see why Wooden was working around the clock. He's seen the daily reports and the withdrawals from the system, and he's probably thinking, what the heck did I just get myself into accepting this impossible job? The quote from the book is, if bold action was not taken, it would mean the obliteration of the banking system. So now we're right at inauguration day and the book details this down to the minute and there's actually debate about whether president hoover would have to take this emergency action or if it would be roosevelt who'd do it right after he was sworn in something had to be done and they just couldn't barely wait for the inauguration to take place but someone had to do something drastic to stop the withdrawals of gold from the banking system (laughs) 
Now, the day before FDR is sworn in at 11.30 p.m. that night, President Hoover calls Roosevelt and tells him he won't be taking any emergency action. It would have to be Roosevelt who does it once he's in office the next day. And that might be a really, really smart play there by Hoover, just knowing that the confidence needs to be behind whatever action goes on here. It's got to be strong and from something new and fresh right from Roosevelt, who has just won this landslide victory. So FDR is sworn in the next day, and just one hour later, Roosevelt issues the executive order to close every bank in the U.S. for three days. And then they add a few very important requirements to the order. They created what they called special trust accounts. These were a new kind of account that could be opened at any bank, but they were used as a way to like to lure people to deposit cash or gold back into the bank that they might have been hiding or afraid to bring to banks. So this new name or this new type of account is what they started for people to just to lure them back into banks and make deposits. And then there's another critical order that they issued. It went beyond just halting the U.S. Mint from gold payouts, but it was a complete ban on the withdrawal of gold from banks and from the government. All gold exports were banned. And just as important, the order also prohibited hoarding of gold, which they added this, they said, would be punishable by a $10,000 fine and up to 10 years in prison. Now, that got everyone's attention. It gets, it gets everyone's attention today. It definitely got their attention back then when, it, when this was all happening. So now they, re, they didn't really get into the details of what exactly was considered hoarding, but that didn't really matter at the time. It was not important. They just needed some strong language here to show they were dead serious about gold staying exactly where they wanted it, which was in the bank vaults or in the government vaults. So I like what Tripp said in his book about all this. Here's how he describes this. He says, never before in the nation's history had a new president taken such sweeping, dramatic, controversial, and complex actions immediately upon taking office. He had invoked war powers and assumed quasi-dictatorial powers. Yet Americans across the country took a collective sigh and began to adjust accordingly. At least they now knew the rules of the game. So Tripp is hinting at some good news there at the end of that excerpt that I just read. He says, Americans across the country took a collective sigh. And with that first executive order, FDR and his crew had just bought some much needed time to think about what else they could do and the next steps. And Will Wooden didn't waste any time at all coming up with his next idea here. He decided the treasury could now issue currency against sound assets deposited at the banks. Now, when I read that for the first time, I was like, "That, yeah, that doesn't sound that crazy of an idea. But at the time, apparently this was a pretty big leap to issue currency. So he realized that if people now trusted that banks were once again capitalized and were backed by the treasury, that new currency could be printed to increase the money supply. So FDR agrees to Wooden's plan, and the book says the president agreed after just 20 minutes of listening to Wooden's idea. If that paints a picture of urgency for you, and on March 9th, just five days after his inauguration, the president signed the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. Here's how David Tripp describes it from his book, The Results of FDR's New Laws. He says, Because of the complexity involved in checking the books of the nation's banks, the bank holiday was extended to March 13th, when the first healthiest banks were allowed to open their doors and conduct business. The effect was electric. The people's confidence was renewed, and money and gold started to pour back into the system. So in just the first few days of FDR's presidency, he takes action almost immediately after one hour of being sworn in. And he ends this runaway train bank panic that was sweeping the nation and the whole world. Once banks finally reopened on March 15th, the stock market rose by 15% and billions poured back into and onto the bank's balance sheets. 
Now to top that all off, and I had no idea about this until just a few days ago when I did a little extra research. This isn't in the book, but just a few weeks before his inauguration on February 15th, Franklin Roosevelt survived an assassination attempt while he was giving a speech in Miami. Just as the gunman started shooting at Roosevelt, a lady standing next to the shooter swung her purse and knocked the guy's shooting arm to the side. After five shots, one of the bullets hits Anton Cermak, who was the mayor of Chicago standing next to Roosevelt, and Cermak later died in the hospital from his gunshot. Five other bystanders were wounded, but the president-elect Roosevelt was unharmed. So if you think about this, these two months of February and March, Roosevelt survives an assassination attempt. He's sworn in as president. He calms the global markets and reverses a banking panic after just a few days in office. And then another week after that, he signed the Cullen Harrison Act, the law that would once again legalize the sale of beer and wine, marking the end of prohibition. So I've only begun my reading on FDR, but he's having quite a start to his first term in office and a very historical beginning to the year of 1933. There's so much history here with FDR. The first New Deal, the Brain Trust, the first hundred days, all of the reforms and programs. The more I was learning about FDR this week, the more I discovered that I didn't know as much as I thought about this guy. I have a book on my shelf. It's called Franklin and Winston. It's about FDR and his relationship with Winston Churchill. And now I can't wait to dig into that book because FDR hasn't seen anything yet. He doesn't just have to save the country from the Great Depression, but he's going to be dealing with Europe and World War II just a few years from now. So I can't wait to learn more about FDR and his terms in office. It's, it's just amazing. But now we need to get back to the gold coins. But actually, before we do, I need to read this from Tripp's book. And he made this comment about William Wooden, FDR's pick for Secretary of Treasury. And a guy who worked night and day to figure out a way through this banking panic. And here's how Tripp says it in his book. Quote, Moley was deeply impressed by the new treasury secretary who he knew was far from well. Capitalism, he wrote, was saved in eight days. And no other single factor in its salvation was half so important as the imagination and sturdiness and common sense of Will Wooden. So there's a huge praise for Will Wooden right there, one of FDR's guys who helped calm the banking panic of 1933. And now we know the crisis was subdued by the immediate actions of FDR as soon as he was sworn in. But we need to look at how this all played out for the gold around the country. With these new laws in effect, now the American people had to actually follow them for all the work. And a big part of that law was to turn in all gold back to the government. And that was something that would take a huge amount of work and coordination and lots of time to figure out. And then there were the questions about it. If the U.S. was no longer on the gold standard and lots of debate about what the gold standard even was or is. So don't feel bad if you don't understand the gold standard, because even back then, the people who were deciding the fate of the entire banking system weren't even completely sure if the U.S. was on it or off it. And I say that because Tripp writes a few things about that in his book. Here's what he said. Perhaps not wanting to discombobulate the public further, or simply unsure of the matter himself, William Wooden went on record the day the gold embargo was announced. He said, quote, it is ridiculous and misleading to say that we have gone off the gold standard, end of quote. His opinion was echoed by former Undersecretary of the Treasury Arthur Ballantyne and Senator Key Pittman of Nevada, who more emphatically interpreted the action as, quote, a protection of the gold standard, end of quote. So it sounds like no politician wanted any part of the gold standard question or to make any bold claims about the gold standard. I'm sure everyone was pretty much just dancing around the issue when pinned down by reporters. If they were smart, because I'm sure there was, they were just trying not to roil any confidence that was starting to build as fragile as this all was at the time. Nobody wanted to rock the boat at this point. 
Here's so here's more debate about the state of the banking system. The book says on this question of the gold standard, I think this is super interesting. Here's what Tripp says in his book. Others disagreed. The New York Daily News pointed out, quite rightly, that as the government itself had stopped honoring its obligations in gold, it was a technical abandonment of the gold standard. In the New York Times, an unnamed but, quote, noted banking authority looked into his crystal ball and saw a bleak future for the gold standard. And this this uh, noted banking authority, he said, they said some persons may not redeposit their gold, in which case they will be forced to bury it because it will be of utterly no use to them. So these laws were passed and the crisis was subdued somewhat. And then everybody started asking, what are we doing here? And then now even more debate and confusion about the status of the gold standard. This is from the president himself, FDR. And David Tripp also includes this in his book. And I think it's really interesting. Tripp in his book, he says, two days later, during the first press conference, the president leaned back in his chair and further fanned the flames of uncertainty. He told nearly 150 reporters who crammed into his office that, quote, as long as nobody asks me whether we are off the gold standard or gold basis, that is all right, because nobody knows what the gold basis or gold standard really is. End of quote. Tripp continues here. He says, this statement may not have been strictly accurate, but it suited FDR to say so. So, and so there's jokes in the Oval Office by the president about the gold standard in front of 150 reporters crammed into his office and plenty of debate going all around. But one thing is certain, the U.S. government was extremely serious about recalling all the gold out there still. And here's details of that gold recall. And the government had to somehow motivate the public to take some action. So, of course, they added some conf some confusing verbiage about penalties and imprisonment if citizens didn't turn in their gold. And this is a quote. All of these instructions forbade the egress of gold from the government. Now it only remained a question of how to encourage, chide, bully, and coerce citizens to take their own gold and yellow notes back to the treasury. In theory, the recall of gold seemed simple. The imposition of penalties for gold hoarding without defining how much gold constituted a hoard was a start. The language of the internal orders was directed by government standards, but still confusing to the citizens it affected. That was from the book. So amazingly, the American public did take action here. There's a point in Tripp's book where he talks about the people returning their gold to the government almost as a patriotic duty, just hoping that it would turn the tide of this awful situation that the country was in. So here's a passage from the book showing how the gold started flowing back into the government's coffers. On March 10th, the passage of the Emergency Banking Act the previous day in record time was the banner news across the nation. It was also the first time the extent of deluge of gold back to the Federal Reserve was reported in depth. And the news was astonishing. More than $65 million had been returned in the three days since the president's initial decree. And then Tripp, in his book, he lists out a, a bunch of the, the total amounts of gold coming back into these certain banks. But then at the end, he says, the rush had just begun. And here's another report from the book on the little guy, the average citizen bringing everything they could find that looked like gold that might help the situation and might help this crisis. The book says, newspapers reported that it was not just businesses and wealthy skeptics redepositing their gold hoards. Law-abiding, everyday citizens went to the banks not thinking of themselves as hoarders, but wanting to do the right thing. They came with little bags, briefcases, paper bundles, boxes, or bulging pockets. Many had only a few coins, while others had bags of thousands of dollars of double eagles. These bags would have included examples of St. Gaudens designs dating from 1907 and those they had replaced, which had been in circulation from 1850 through 1907. So that's Tripp's book. He's saying that people were returning their gold coins, and especially these double eagles that were had been 
produced by the government since 1850. So all these citizens, these amazing St. God's gold coins were getting turned back in and eventually they were all getting melted down. And it, it wasn't just thousands of bags of gold coins locked in the bank vaults that were melted, but even individual coins from the public that were turned back in. And exactly the reason why these double eagle coins now became so rare and valuable. It's just because there was this point in time where they were recalled and melted down. So whatever coins remained now to this day can be extremely valuable now. And here's another account from the book. And it just shows how motivated people were to turn in their gold. It was people in fear or confusion or just trying to do the right thing or just a mixture of all of the above. Here's how the book says it. He says, on March 10th, 1933, the gold stampede in reverse was on. In New York, men and women frightened by the draconian punishments threatened by the government, braving gale force winds and temperatures in the 20s, nervously descended at dawn on the Federal Reserve Bank of New York at 33 Liberty Street. So they're turning in their gold. And so trip goes on right here. It's the banking emergency continued, but there were signs of abatement. The banks at last began to reopen the most fiscally sound first. Confidence as well as gold was flowing back into the system. With a bit of bait and switch, the president extended the deadline for gold returns by another four days until St. Patrick's Day. Perhaps a rainbow would emerge from these pots of gold. Another great summary right there by David Tripp. He's painting the picture and the great writing too. Of course, I love how descriptive he is. He says, quote, the gold stampede in reverse. And you can see this tide is starting to turn and the president and his crew are beginning to sense that they are gaining some traction in this fight to save the banks. But the president and Will Wooden, they need to keep the pressure on and make sure the banking panic doesn't flare back up. The successful gold recall was in motion now, but there's still a staggering amount of gold that needs to be returned to the U.S. government. And they knew these amounts. So here's what Tripp says. But on April 5th, Roosevelt and Wooden's patience with the gold hoarders ran out. $633 million had been returned in a month. But the government estimated that a billion dollars in gold was still outstanding. $600 million in currency and $400 million in coin and bullion. And so they knew the numbers and they're waiting and they're counting and they know there's still a billion out there somewhere. And so Tripp, this is from the book, he keeps going. He, he says, on April 3rd, the president forwarded to Attorney General Homer Cummings a copy of the new executive order, which I have under consideration forbidding the hoarding of gold coin, gold bullion, and gold certificates. He asked Cummings, quote, Please give me your opinion as soon as possible as to whether this order complies in all respects with the provisions of the Constitution and all other applicable laws. End of quote. Within 24 hours, the Attorney General gave the thumbs up. And on April 5th, 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued Executive Order 6102. That's crazy. So he was asking the attorney general if this complies with the constitution and all other laws. He wanted to be sure he wasn't going too far here, but he's got a few things going for him. They're going to bend some rules just to make sure they get out of this somehow. So there are these rules issued in the executive order that clarified what hoarding actually meant. So finally, people understand a little bit more about this. Anything over $100 worth was considered hoarding. But there were also provisions for coin collectors. And actually, Will Wooden was a big, big coin collector back in his day. I think he had sold off his entire collection by now, but he was a coin collector. So I'm sure he had some input on this ruling. But they added an exemption for, quote, Gold coins having a recognized special value to collectors of rare and unusual coins. End of quote. 
And then I, after I read that, I just feel terrible for all the honest citizens out there who returned all their gold coins immediately in March, right after this ruling came down, because this exemption was made and clarified um, in early April. So there's a few weeks there where, you know, a bunch of collectors probably turned in all their gold coins, and then they were probably kicking themselves after this April ruling came down, where they made this exemption for coin collectors. But anyway... So the gold recall continued nationwide. The book in David Tripp's book, he talks about another dozen executive orders through the year of 1933 that addressed locating gold and bringing it back into the government's possession. This was, a, this was crucial for the survival of the banks. And so they went as far as passing the Gold Reserve Act of 1934, proclaiming that all gold, with just a few exceptions, was official property of the government of the United States. So now their language is getting even tougher and stricter for gold. And David Tripp talks about this too in his, in his book. This is what he says. With this act, gold coins were no longer a part of the American monetary system. It was the end of a grand tradition. The birth of America's gold coins had been an integral part of debates by founding fathers Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson over the establishment of the United States Mint in the 18th century. And Tripp continues here in his book. He says, Gold was the fuel for discovery of which in 1848, in vast amounts in California, had created great personal fortunes, including those of Leland Stanford, Collis Huntington, and Darius Ogden Mills, and had helped to propel an awkward, insular, an adolescent nation into the ranks of some of the wealthiest countries on earth. And then here's another great passage by Tripp in his book. He, we have to remember the connection of the St. God's double eagle gold coins. They were first created at the request of President Theodore Roosevelt 25 years earlier, who just happened to be FDR's cousin. So Tripp reminds us of this unusual connection here. He says, Ironically, Franklin Roosevelt rang the death knell for the coins whose innovative designs his exuberant cousin Theodore had battled so zealously to achieve. And I did an episode already on the on this exact subject, with which I loved learning about this, the zealous battle of Theodore Roosevelt, like Tripp just said, to get these coins designed back in the early 1900s. That was an awesome story. If you love Theodore Roosevelt, like I do, you have to check out that story. But anyway, back to Tripp. He says this, Will Wooden, the passionate collector, was extinguishing the very coins he loved. But in the battle to save the nation's economy, there is no record that either man gave these ironies a moment's thought. And so it's just a crazy coincidence. The Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt connection here with these 25 years later melting down all of the St. Gaudens gold coins. And there's no record of FDR talking about that fact which is completely understandable, I guess, which he, he's trying to save the entire world economy, basically. So his mind is plenty busy and he's so busy that here's another thing you, to point out. During the rush to save the banking system right after the inauguration, Wooden orders the U.S. Mint not to pay out any more gold coins, but they forgot to instruct the Mint to stop production of gold coins. So of course the Mint continues striking new 1933 St. Gaudens Double Eagles, even with all the new gold laws taking effect. And here's Tripp from his book. He said, from March through May, as the new coins rang to life, they were massed in the blackness of the mint's vaults, sequestered from their sisters. They were the last gold coin struck by America, her last treasure. So now we come all the way back to the coins, the St. Gaudens Double Eagles from 1933. We began the episode by talking about how these coins started to be struck by the mint equipment. Then we had to go straight into the banking crisis because that's the biggest story driving everything in 1933. So FDR and Will Wooden and all the new laws set into place to divert the entire banking system from collapse... But what about John Garrett, the famous coin collector from Baltimore who wrote the letter to his coin dealer, the letter that we started the episode with? 
this is what I read at the beginning of this episode. He's trying to find out if he can add a few 1933 gold coins to his collection. The big question remains for John Garrett, are there any of these coins out there? And if so, why can't his great coin dealer find any for him? So let's find out what happened during this unbelievable year of 1933. What happened to the 1933 double eagles that the mint just struck during this crisis? We talked earlier about the minting process and how many double eagles were made. So the entire minting process from February 18th to May 19th of 1933 is when all the double eagle gold coins were created. We know that from the records at the Mint. So then you have FDR and Will Wooden fighting the banking crisis and the gold stampede in reverse. Like Tripp said, the 1933 double eagles were created at this exact same time. Just business as usual in the corner of the U.S. Mint, almost like nothing at all was happening. So with 10 separate deliveries from the mint coiner to the mint cashier from March 15th to May of 1933, all the coins are now delivered to the mint cashier. There's 100,000 coins in March, 200,000 coins in April, and then 245,500 coins in May. That's 545,500 coins struck in 1933, per the very specific and accurately kept records at the Mint. That's how we know all these numbers are exact, but we'll get into that in a second. Now, special testing has to occur just like every year before it. It's where a handful of coins are just randomly pulled out and tested by the Assay Commission to guarantee the quality. So 20 coins went to Washington, to the Assay, and they called them specials. And then 446 were sent to the assay commission. Once the first six coins were tested by the assayer and passed, when the report was received back at the Philadelphia Mint, usually that would designate the first day that the coins could be issued just to be sent out into circulation. Problem was that Roosevelt's gold recall started three weeks prior to the assayer test. Gold was now pouring back into the government's vaults by every law-abiding citizen in the country. So according to the cashier's daily records at the Mint, no 1933 double eagles were distributed after they passed this assayer's test. So what remained were 480 1933 double eagles in two bags sitting in the cashier's private vault. The rest of the nearly 445,000 double eagles were locked underground in the cashier's working vault, what they called Vault E. So all of these coins, which it was 1,780 bags full of coins, they were all moved down from Vault E down the hall to Vault F. Each bag was accounted for by three members of the settlement committee. And then a handwritten ledger was signed by each of these members. But on this form, there was one more signature, an authorized representative of the Mint superintendent, whatever that means. But Tripp's book calls him an authorized representative of the Mint superintendent, a guy by the name of George A. McCann. Here's how Tripp summarizes this in his book, and I got to read it. Quote, caged the 1933 double eagles. America's last gold coins lay dormant, facing extinction, never to be collected, spent, or saved. Gathering dust, not interest. Yet some would be sprung and spirited well beyond their dungeon, drawing after them a fury of dragons intent on their return. That's a great line right there from Tripp. Don't forget that last phrase. He just said, quote, drawing a fury of dragons intent on their return. And so we'll come back to that in a second. But what now? How does this story end? We have a full-blown gold recall going on across the country and bags full of gold coins sitting in mint vaults. Well, it would only make sense to gather up all this gold that's pouring back into the government's possession, and we got to try to consolidate it all somehow. So after the 1934 Gold Reserve Act passed in January, 
the government revalued the price of gold from $20.67 per ounce to $35 per ounce. Now, all that gold that was recalled over the previous year, now it's much, much more valuable. The next order from the Gold Reserve Act was that all monetary gold was to be held as bars. The order states that gold coins were forbidden. So the obvious next steps would be to melt all the gold coins and turn them into gold bars. So the director of the U.S. Mint, Nellie Taylor Ross, ordered the mints in Philadelphia, Denver, and San Francisco to begin melting all general stocks of domestic gold coins. Here's how David Tripp explained it in his book. He said, quote, It was the beginning of the end for all the gold coins stored in the government vaults. The furnaces at the mint would now blaze. Each day, 84,000 ounces of gold coin was metamorphosized into bars. The smoke that issued from the tall stack that loomed above the mint added to the hazy pall that hung over the city. At this rate, it would take more than two and a half years to melt the nation's vast hoard of gold coins. So as the U.S. Mint's preparing to melt all gold coins and turn them into bars, Nellie Ross sent an order to Philadelphia for sample coins to be sent to the Smithsonian Institution for the National Coin Collection. So just two 1933 double eagles found their way to the Smithsonian somehow, luckily before they were all ordered to be melted down. But it turns out the coins had been withdrawn from the cashier's vault by, guess who? George A. McCann, who also controlled 469 more 1933 double eagles. The remaining 445,000 double eagles from 1933 remained locked in vault F. Now, during the same time, the country was melting down all gold coins to form gold bars. They decided to build a new facility for all of this gold. And it was under construction at this time. And it was in the countryside near Camp Knox, Kentucky, what would become Fort Knox, of course. Everybody knows what that is now. So all gold coins melted into gold bars would be shipped off to the new facility and David Tripp has a good description of that, so I'm going to read this. The spot had been selected by Roosevelt not for its superior security, but because he felt that having the riches in one spot in America's heartland would be psychologically comforting to Americans. And who could say he was wrong? The gold depository at Fort Knox, a small, squat building, constructed of concrete, steel, and granite, which looks as though it had been dropped from above and simply sunk into the ground, has entered the vernacular as symbolizing the invulnerability of the enormous wealth of the United States. That wealth was in the form of gold bars, ton upon ton. Each bar had been formed from gold coins, once gleaming works of art. The gold was now rendered into plain utilitarian bricks that were not adorned with symbols of a nation's great ideals, but furnished with a series of numbers that coldly stated the country's bottom line. So two years later, the gold coins are still not completely melted down, but getting really close. By February 3rd, 1937, it's almost complete. And now a curious entry at the Philadelphia Mint appeared. When George McCann broke the seal on Vault F for the first time since June 1933, but it was resealed on the same day, the entry in the log, the Mint log, it read, quote, with former values, 1933, intact, end of quote. So finally, all the 1933 double eagle coins in Vault F rolled down the hall to the melting and the refining room where they would be transformed into gold bars and eventually trucked to Fort Knox where they still might be sitting there to this day. And so David Tripp adds this part in his book, 445,000 1933 double eagles from the lower vault and 469 from the cashier's vault had met their scalding ends in the previous weeks. 29 others had been destroyed during this, say, in earlier years. The columns in the ledgers balanced. 
the only two extant 1933 double eagles resided in the national collection at the Smithsonian Institution. And as far as the United States government was concerned, the book on the 1933 double eagles were closed for good. End of quote. And now, of course, we know that that wasn't the case. The ledgers showed they balanced, but the ledgers were wrong. A few 1933 St. God's double eagle gold coins flew the coop. They slipped out of the mint and they found their way into the hands of collectors. But who was it? How did they acquire them? Who ended up with these coins? What happened? So I want to read this from David Tripp because we wrap up this episode on how the 1933 double eagle became the most valuable coin in the world with this excerpt from the great book called Illegal Tender. Early February 1937, Philadelphia. Israel Swit, a 41-year-old jeweler and old gold dealer in Jewelers Row, sat in his shop and looked at his latest purchase. In the gloomy half-light of his office, the small group of gold coins glinted alluringly. He picked one of the coins up and examined it. It was a double eagle and bore the date... 1933. Somehow a few had survived. Two months later, in the April 1937 edition of the Numismatic Scrapbook, reported the latest scuttlebutt in the coin collecting hobby concerning the fate of the 1933 double eagles. And in the book, it said, quote, it has been reported that a few escaped the melting pot and those in the hands of collectors and dealers are being held at a fancy price. End of quote. And then Tripp adds, their time had come. So their time had come for these coins. It didn't take long for a few 1933 double eagles to surface. And I'm sure every great coin collector and dealer at the time, they were working their connections, trying to find one of these amazing coins. So where did they come from? If you keep reading the book, you might just start to solve this mystery, but I have to leave it right here for now. There's no way I'm going to spoil the ending of this book by telling you what happens. You really do need to read this all the way through. And that's assuming that anyone even knows how a few of these coins escaped the U.S. mint walls before they were melted down. Maybe we'll never know exactly what happened. Or will we? I don't know. You have to read this entire book to find out. But let me remind you that we're still just a few chapters into David Tripp's book. I've already done a full episode a while back on the creation of the coin by Augustus St. Gaudens and Theodore Roosevelt. One of the great coin creator's stories, and I love doing that episode, but that entire episode covered only the first chapter of this book by Tripp, Illegal Tender. Now, the second episode that we just, co- we just talked about on Tripp's book It just covered the next two more chapters after that. There's 21 chapters in his book. There's so much more to this story, you wouldn't even believe it. And that's why his book is so amazing. It just goes on and on. And it's totally thrilling to read this book. And I've read the entire book a couple times now. And every time I come back to the book, I'm reminded of how great of a story this is. The 1933 St. Gaudens Double Eagle. We talk a lot about rarity, especially coin collectors. They love that word, rarity. Only 10 or 20 coins, only 50 known examples. The finest known example or none graded higher. These are some of the common phrases that you're going to hear about the most valuable coins in the world. But what I love about the 1933 Double Eagle story is that there was supposed to be zero known These were supposed to all be melted down and officially gone, just with the exception of the two sitting in the Smithsonian, which everybody knew about. Every other coin, these were all supposed to be melted and they were not to exist. And then once they were discovered that they did exist, unprecedented actions were taken by the government to reel these coins back in. And that's what the rest of David Tripp's book is about. And and so just a little teaser for you, the fugitive coins that nobody knew existed were completely outlawed and forbidden to own. Hence the title of the book, Illegal Tender. And so it became the biggest coin hunt in history. So if you want rarity, 
it really doesn't get any better than this story, the 1933 double eagle from a population of zero <laughs> than, than to suddenly discovered. That's a big part of the intrigue with these coins. So now I got to remind you to check out a couple of my other episodes on the greatest coins ever created. I have an episode on the 1804 silver dollar and how it took the greatest coin collectors over a hundred years to solve the mystery of how that coin came to be. And then I also have an episode on the 1794 silver dollar and the events that led to the creation of the U.S. Mint building. And then how the very first silver dollars were struck back in 1794, tracing all the way back to the founding fathers and the amazing history of how they decided to set up the monetary system that we still use to this day in the United States. That was a fun story. And I could easily do another episode on the 1794 silver dollar and all those characters that were involved. That was a lot of fun. So the coin stories never disappoint. Learning about the world's greatest coins and how they were created always delivers. I'm telling you, the history, the stories, the unbelievable characters involved in creating these great coins, and then all of the events that are swirling around these coins at the time, there are endless reasons that millions and millions of people love collecting coins. And it's just so much fun to dissect the history of something like the 1933 St. Gaudens Double Eagles, like we just talked about, especially when you have an incredible book like David Tripp's Illegal Tender. So I would strongly recommend you go buy a copy of this book for yourself. You're not going to believe the level of detail and history and great descriptive writing that you're going to find in this book. So I'm really looking forward to my next episode on coins. I really don't have any idea where it's going to take me, but I'm hoping you're going to check that out and tune back in. And I really appreciate you listening to this story. And now I'm hoping that we can both learn more. <laughs>